Welcome to Euro PCR uh, 2023. I am Natalia Pinila, an interventional cardiologist in McMaster University, Canada, and I have the pleasure to be with Seattle Lee from San Francis Hospital in New York today. Um, and we are going to have an interesting discussion about NSTEMI, multivessel disease, culprit lesion versus non culprit lesions. So, Siak, this is kind of an interesting topic because we have focused so much on STEMI, so much on complex PCI, on other topics, but NSTEMI is a big population in our practice. And uh, it's a challenging presentation. Uh, what we have to do is not clear in all of those cases, and there is a huge window of patients either with no clear culprit disease, with multivessel severe disease, or uh, patients that might be dealing with other uh, comorbidities, infection, stroke, any other uh, clinical situations, and might be just having a type two um, ischemia. So how do you think is the most important message to transfer how to diagnose culprit lesions in NSTEMI population? So uh, it's great to be here, Natalia, with you. I think one of the first things to step back and look at is what you mentioned in the beginning, you know, we did a lot of research in STEMI, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of research in stable CAD, and all of our prognostic benefit probably lives in the end STEMI area where we haven't spent so much time, and, and that's one of the areas where PCI has shown a very, very clear benefit. So there's lots of work to be done, and I think this is an example of what you bring up. Now, how do we use intravascular imaging and physiology in end STEMI? Right now, I'd say the mainstay of treatment is angiography. You know, these are often on-call patients, they have troponin elevations, usually a culprit lesion is identifiable. But as patients are getting older and disease is getting more complex, it's really not unusual for us to see end STEMI patients who have multiple ambiguous lesions mm -hmm. where we aren't sure what the culprit is. So we have a few different ways to kind of figure that out. Obviously one way is to use intravascular imaging, and I think in that regard, OCT is the standard. Mm -hmm. And the real reason for that is it has the resolution to be able to identify plaque rupture, but also intact fibrous cap ACS, so thrombus on top of neointima. IBIS can also be beneficial, but I think that it doesn't really have the resolution so easily to say identify sort of small plaque rupture. Uh, and of course, it, it does have the limitation of resolution with that regard. So how do I use it? Maybe that's the best way to start. Mm -hmm. I think in the acute setting, intravascular imaging helps you identify the culprit. So it helps me do my procedure at that time. So first, I can know which one the lesion is, and then I can use the same MLD Max guided approach to optimize my PCI, make sure I get a good result. Now what we do with the ambiguous lesions or the residual lesions is not so clear yet versus with imaging. And I, and I have to compliment your excellent work from Complete, which showed that this is a unique population of patients. They're kind of hot. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a face full of acne, yeah. that's how I think of them, right? So yeah. you're probably gonna get another pop sometime soon. You need to soothe this down. And as you showed very clearly in the Complete OCT substudy, these patients have a lot more thin cap fiber atheroma in their obstructive lesions and we also know that those lesions with high lipid burden and small minimal lumen area from the recent data from Harbin are the really at-risk lesions. Unfortunately, we don't have clinical evidence to say treating those provides a benefit, but we do have the data from Complete which shows treating the 70% lesions. I think this is an unanswered question where Complete 2 is really gonna help us, so maybe you could tell me about how the OCT sub-study is gonna help me as a practitioner. Yeah, so that's a good question because we have been um, thinking that uh, it's hard to transfer everything we know from STEMI to any STEMI population. So why don't we study this as a group of acute coronary syndrome population with high risk vulnerability, uh, fissures, diffuse atherosclerosis is probably a better way to think about it and also to avoid these patients have future outcomes because it's very frustrating for us in clinical practice that we treat the most severe stenosis, we treat what we think we should treat and the patient will, the patient will benefit from, but then they keep coming back with, uh, with acute coronary syndromes in the future. So 
then in our minds is like, what is the best techniques? We have so many techniques available now. What is the best technique? What does it matter in this population? Is ischemia what matters in this population? Is plaque vulnerability? Is um, how diffuse is the atherosclerosis? And it might change our understanding of what medications we should consider to these patients in the long term as well. So I think complete to trial is gonna help us to understand what is the role of physiology in acute coronary syndrome, both STEMI and NSTEMI. And also with OCT, we want to understand uh, we know by now the most severe lesions have more vulnerability, but there are other segments in the vasculature that have diffuse atherosclerosis. You might also have a TICFA in a non-significant stenose vessel, and that might be related to a future outcome as well. So this is an opportunity to do a multi-vessel OCT imaging in ACS population and understand whether those features of vulnerability are really going to be related to outcomes. As you're saying, I think we are missing that piece right now in our clinical practice, and we really need to some reassurement whether, what do we have to do with those lesions? You know, it's interesting you mentioned that, because if you look at the CT data, mm -hmm. you can see that the patients, uh, for example, in stable CAD, almost 60% of acute coronary syndromes come from lesions that are less than 60%. Mm -hmm. So those TICFAs, or those high-risk lesions that are sit sitting around in bystander, aren't really bystanders, and they can actually become acute lesions. Um, I wanted to go back to your second question, which was the part for physiology, because it's interesting. I don't think most of us use physiology to determine what the culprit lesion is, because it really can't do that. What physiology has been shown to do, compare acute, dynami, primalty, is Help us, once we've identified and treated the culprit, what to do with the non-culprit lesions. And what I think we've shown is that you can reduce unplanned, oh, sorry, unplanned revascularization or clinically driven revascularization by using physiology acutely. But I would say that the holy grail of this is the combination of those two modalities. You have intravascular imaging to determine which is the culprit and treat it and then physiology to determine whether or not you should perform treatment on your non-culprit lesions. That's a f sort of, that's the complete revascularization done functionally that provides the maximum benefit for the patient. And this is where I'm really excited about combined technology, mm -hmm. where we can actually use intravascular imaging that models FFR or non-hyperemic pressure ratios and gives us the combination of physiology and imaging. We've actually recently uh, got our first device and started using it. And honestly, it, we are finding some fascinating results by going back to our older patients and saying, well, actually, yeah, we treated the culprit lesion, but the non-culprit, even though the MLA was four, was actually had a lot of high-risk features and had a positive FFR. So that's where I see the field going intertwining these two modalities together and instead of creating separate buckets of physiology imaging putting physiology and imaging together clinically for us i think in clinical practice we have been gone through this time that these two technologies overlap in clinical practice and um, we didn't really know what to use in what setting so i agree with you people thought they had to pick one but actually they have completely different roles in PCI, in ACS, as you're saying, um, the comparison of diagnosing a, a plaque rupture with intraluminal thrombosis of a luminal stenosis that is very tight and is provoking ischemia are two completely different questions. But I agree with you that those two, we need those two to understand what lesions benefit from PCI and Compared to just driving everything by angiography, we come to the risks to do multivessel PCI and do so extensive PCI in patients, and that might not be needed if we understand well what is the vulnerability and what is the ischemia for those, uh, for those lesions. I, you know, the, the one thing that you said there that really resonates with me is clearly angiography is not enough, mm -hmm. okay? This, you can miss the culprit lesion, then you can under or over treat the other lesions, do a suboptimal job in a high risk patient that's hot, that's a bad, you know, the, the beginning of badness. So using physiology and imaging in combination to treat these patients, at least right now, 
has to be the optimal approach. And while it might be more costly, it is the right thing to do, specifically when we have ambiguous lesions where we're not sure what we need to do. And, uh, and I really believe uh, using imaging, uh, you have done an amazing work in how to guide PCI with imaging and the MLD algorithm and just taking in account everything you need to understand before you do a PCI. With this approach, you're no just diagnosing, but you're just treating your patient the way you have to treat and do optimal PCI. Because in ACS, we rush our PCIs, we feel just restoring the flow, we're fine, and putting a small size of stent um, is fine, but we don't take the time to really do the type of PCI that patient needs and optimizing the PCI well. So I think if we have these two technologies combined and people are trained to understand uh, the results and how to integrate that in the PCI is going to be great for the outcomes of our patients. You know, our job over the next few years as a community is to make the complex simple. Mm -hmm. Right now, NSTEMI treatment, which lesions treat, which not, is complex. And the tools that we have have to be used to simplify that. So interventional cardiologists all over the world can simplify how to treat and whether to treat. Yeah. Totally agree, and uh, I think this population is actually one of the largest population in our clinical practice everywhere. And um, they have more comorbidities than the STEMI population as well, so I think they deserve a lot of our attention, a lot of uh, these techniques to be used in their procedures, and hopefully this is gonna uh, translate in better outcomes for this population in the future. Thank you so much for having Osiari, me. Osiari, it was amazing to have this conversation with you. Okay, continue enjoying EuroPCR 2023.